This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. We are back with season six. More delightful, compelling, troubling, educational, joyous episodes. Breaking down those false dichotomies. And to start out season six, another New York Times best-selling author for you. In what seems to be an obvious upside of wealth and upward social mobility, many of us have instant and easy access to much that promises us pleasure. In the language of brain chemistry, massive hits of dopamine are available to us most any place, most any time, day or night, dusk and dawn. But today, we explore this question. What are some of the costs of that relentless pursuit of pleasure? Every pleasure has a cost, and that cost is pain. That's Dr. Anna Lemke, professor and psychiatrist, chief of the Stanford Addiction Medical Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University, author of the New York Times bestselling book, Dopamine Nation, subtitled Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. Dr. Lemke points out that we are now bombarded with dopamine hits at every turn. The opportunity for a craving is seemingly available everywhere, from the potato chip bag to the prescription drugs or the infinite feed right there in your pocket. But with a plethora of promises of feel-good options, why are rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide rising in the wealthiest nations? Why is the life expectancy for some in America actually decreasing for the first time in a century. It turns out that the relentless pursuit of pleasure demands a steep price. And we can either pay that up front or we can pay it afterwards. And with things that are immediately reinforcing like drugs and alcohol or digital drugs like social media, video games, pornography, we will pay a price. And that price will be the come down. So perhaps you, my friend, might know such addictive effects, might know that compulsivity and craving from your smartphone or from food or drink or sex or drugs or shopping. Apparently, a lot of us do. Well, what then? Dr. Lemke frames the problem and provides some practical and tested advice often derived from her many years of clinical practice. Very grateful to share this episode with you coming right up. One note before we start what I think is a wonderful and helpful conversation with Dr. Anna Lemke. At one point during the interview, one of my recording devices went out and you'll hear a drop in my audio quality. That will last for a portion of the episode and then return to normal. Forgive the technical difficulty, but we wanted you to have the full conversation. Also, this important heads up, this episode contains conversations around sex and sexual activity that might not be appropriate, probably (laughs) is not appropriate for younger listeners. Here we go. Dr. Anna Lemke is a psychiatrist, the chief of the Stanford Addiction Medical Dual Diagnosis Clinic at Stanford University. She's a specialist in the opioid epidemic in the United States. She maintains an active clinical practice while also doing things like TED Talks, testifying before the U.S. Congress and Senate, while keeping up with an active speaking schedule. Today, we're discussing her New York Times bestselling book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. Welcome, Dr. Lemke. Thank you for having me. It's a delight to have you have you with us. When you think about the problem that you're seeking to describe in your book, you come at this from a lot of different angles the rise of certain forms of technology that we want to talk about, what's happening neuroscientifically in our brain, even economics. But I wonder if you could start, instead of any of those places, start with us in describing some of the people that you encounter and their own struggles that could kind of give us a picture of the kind of problem or the kind of struggle that you're addressing in your book. Sure. I'm happy to do that. I I can start that by expressing gratitude to my patients who have given me permission to share their stories mm. that I include in Dopamine Nation and that I'll, you know, I can share with you here. 
Otherwise, I would not be able to to do that, right? right. Because of confidentiality, <laughs> which I I really you know respect very highly. Yeah. So one of the main cases that I talk about in my book is a middle aged man, a scientist, a very kind, wonderful father and husband, who came to me seeking help for a very profound sex addiction, sex pornography and compulsive masturbation. And I see more and more of those types of cases. The advent of the smartphone in the early 2000s created a, an influx of patients seeking help specifically for online pornography addiction. And, and all of them, you know, w- without fail, identified the smartphone with its 24-7 internet access as the precipitating factor for them tipping from sort of recreational intermittent use of pornography and masturbation to compulsive, dysregulated, very harmful use. But what really stood out with this particular case was that he had invented a a literal masturbation machine um, out of a variety of parts. He, He is an engineer and a scientist, and so he was very good at building things and ultimately progressed to the point where he, you know, hooked his genitals up to the internet and made it possible for other people that he met in chat rooms to actually control him, see him. That struck me as both a horrific and also very apt metaphor for the ways in which we are all, in a way, titillating ourselves to death through the internet. Mm. And although we may not have built our own masturbation machines, we all or many of us, most of us, are on our digital devices, which serve a very similar purpose. Because at the end of the day, what is a masturbation machine? It's a way to meet some of our most fundamental needs without the help of another person or without the help of Hmm. the people who are most important to us in our lives. It's a way to reach out to anonymous strangers to get those needs met. So, yeah, so that's one example. Yeah, you you say you've already begun to comment on the smartphone, but you say, quote, the smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle delivering dopamine 24 seven for a wired generation. Talk to us a little bit more about how you see the smartphone and technology as central to the, the rise of such a problem. To understand that metaphor, let me tell a little bit about the history of opioids because it's it's parallel mm-hmm. and it's it's relevant. So o- opioids are really any chemical that bind to our opioid receptors in our body. Almost everything that's addictive is something that occurs in in nature or external to us that mimics a chemical our body already makes. So we make our own opioids. And for Millions and millions of years, people have used opioids, and some small percentage of them have gotten addicted to opioids through their cultivation of the poppy plant, which is the source of opium. What happened in the early 1800s is that technology allowed scientists to um, derive in the laboratory a more, more potent form of opium called morphine, which then very rapidly led to an increase in people getting addicted to opioids because it was more available and because it was more potent. And that's a theme that um, I talk about throughout my book, how access, quantity, potency, and novelty are four of the characteristics in modernity that contribute uh, to the problem of addiction of many different types of drugs. Say those those four. Sure. So access, right? Access, our our access to a drug is, is in fact one of the biggest risk factors for getting addicted to any drug. If, if you live in a neighborhood where that drug is re- readily available, you're more likely to try it, more likely to get addicted. Quantity is the second one. So if if the drug is more bountiful, in fact, if it's infinite, you might think here of TikTok, uh, you're more likely mm-hmm. to get addicted to the drug because it doesn't run out. Number three is potency. That has to do with you know how much bang for our buck we get. The more potent a drug is, the more dopamine it releases in the reward pathway. And technology has created... Um, incredibly potent drugs, uh, including uh, drugs that are potent that didn't even exist before. And then finally, you have novelty. So dopamine, which is our reward neurotransmitter, is extremely sensitive to newness. Anything that's new in the environment will trigger dopamine, which is why we can even get addicted to 
things like bad news through doom scrolling. That's mm. because dopamine is released in response to newness, new being, uh, you know, the fundamental uh, word in news. But getting back to opioids, so in the early 1800s, we saw the creation of, of morphine or the, the discovery of this alkali derived from opium, which was morphine, which was more potent. And people, more people got addicted because they had you know, more access to this higher potency drug. And then came along uh, the invention of the hypodermic syringe in the 1850s. And this was, law, this was heralded to be an amazing invention because it would allow people to inject drugs directly into the bloodstream. And it was hypothesized that people were less likely to get addicted to drugs like opioids if they were directly injected into the bloodstream. Hmm. Now, anybody who's listening out there knows that that <laughs> turned out to be very, very wrong because, in fact, the opposite was true. What, what that allowed was that instead of having to smoke the drug or eat the drug, you could now deliver the drug directly to the brain, which made it much, much more potent because one of the ways to increase potency is to change the delivery mechanism. So that then led to the narcomania um, that started in the late 1800s during the Civil War really exploded you know, in the early 1900s, which then um, led to the creation of or the discovery of a new form of a medicine that was going to replace morphine and was going to be have all of the pain-relieving properties of morphine, but not any of the addictive potential of morphine. And that was discovered by Bayer Pharmaceuticals in Germany. And they were so excited about this new discovery that they called it heroish, which is German for heroic. And that, of course, was heroin. So you're seeing a pattern here. You're seeing a pattern. And let's just fast forward all the way to the you know late 1900s with the discovery of fentanyl, which is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine, can be made in the laboratory cheaply without even using a plant precursor. So you don't need any more poppy mm. plants. You can make it just from chemicals. And here we are in the opioid epidemic. And that trajectory can be traced with every drug that you can name. An increase in access, potency, novelty, and quantity that makes us all more vulnerable to the problem of addiction. How do you see that metaphor of the cell phone as a hypodermic needle coming full circle with that sort of history? So what the smartphone allowed was for 24-7 access to digital drugs. And that means there's no stopping point. At any moment, whatever we're doing, we can reach for that phone and access a digital drug that we can get lost in. And that means that we were, we are now, all of us with rare exception, very, very vulnerable to getting addicted to digital content in all its, you know, manifold forms. Is the issue of addiction primarily then a correlate with rise in wealth? So, yes, it is. That's right. Because it is this kind of overabundance that we experience in the modern world kind of the dark side of successful capitalism that leads to our increased access to all kinds of consumer products, which are engineered to be reinforcing, which are engineered for us to want to consume more. In addition to the very abundant supply of these highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, we also, in wealthy countries, have more leisure time than ever before. So for example, the average person today has about you know four hours of leisure time. 25 to 50 years from now, we're projected to have up to seven hours of leisure time per day. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. Because we've invented machines to do much of our labor because there are so many of us. So there's less actual work for us to do in order to survive and much more disposable income our income gap not, notwithstanding, which is a true and real problem. It's also true that even the poorest of the poor today living in wealthy nations have more disposable income to spend on luxury consumer goods than ever before in the history of the human race. 
we're also living longer. So in addition to having more time on any given day, uh, because of, of increased leisure, we also have more days through most of human existence. People lived on average to age 30. Now people are living on average, you know, many more decades than that. Two more quick questions, still exploring uh, the problem that you're helping us get at. Uh, one is uh, your commentary on the rise of so-called deaths of despair. Would you give us a little commentary on that? Sure. So the deaths of despair is a phrase that was coined by Anne Case and Angus Deaton, two Princeton economists, to describe the decrease in lifespan seen in middle-aged white Americans for the first time in generations due to the top three causes of death in that demographic, uh, which have been documented to be cirrhosis, primarily due to alcoholic liver cirrhosis, drug overdoses, and suicide. So for many generations now, people have been living longer than their parents and grandparents. But now for the first time in maybe 100 or more years, uh, we have a, a demographic, white America, white middle-aged America, who are dying younger than their parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And the leading causes of death are, as I named, drug overdoses, suicides, and addiction, alcohol addiction. So this is a very powerful um, because, again, what it says is that we've reached some kind of tipping point where our technology and our innovation and our science has allowed us to live longer through antibiotics and cancer treatment and all the things that normally would kill us or no longer killing us, but now we're killing ourselves with, with overconsumption. The, the other piece of it that, that I really highlight, though, is the rising rates of suicide, depression, and anxiety. If you look at those rates in the last 30 years, there's been an increase in almost every country in the world, with the steepest rises in the wealthiest nations, which is a paradox, uh, because it suggests that the richer we get, the more unhappy we get. And this is documented in a lot of different ways. And even confounds like access to mental health treatment don't explain this phenomenon. In fact, the highest rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide uh, occur in the countries with the most access to mental health treatment, which strongly suggests that we're not understanding some fundamental causative piece here about why we're so unhappy and why we're, why we're suicidal. What I put forth as a potential hypothesis is, is that it's actually the stress of overabundance which is causing us to be unhappy. And I explain that uh, with the neuroscience of addiction. You suggest that, quote, the reason we're all so miserable may be because we're working so hard to avoid being miserable. So talk to us a little bit about how that could possibly be the case. So neuroscience has shown in the last 50 to 75 years that the same parts of the brain that process pleasure also process pain. That is to say they're co-located and that they work like opposite sides of a balance. Um, and so in the book, I use this extended metaphor of like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground that represents how we process pleasure and pain. When we experience pleasure, it tips one way, and when we experience pain, it tips the other. But there's a very important rule governing this balance, and it is that the balance wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be deviated for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And with any deviation from neutrality, our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance. And here's the key piece. The way our brain restores a level balance is first by tilting equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So if we do something pleasurable, which releases dopamine in our brain's reward pathway, a very specific identified circuit in the brain, our brain responds immediately by tipping our balance an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect, the hangover. And it does that before going back to the level position. So that's really, really important information because it tells us that in the, in the neurobiological economy, every pleasure has a cost and that cost is pain. Mm -hmm. And we can either 
pay that up front or we can pay it afterwards. And with things that are immediately reinforcing like drugs and alcohol or digital drugs, like social media, video games, pornography, we will pay a price and that price will be the come down. And this is essential for understanding what happens in our brains as we become addicted. Because the second rule of the balance is that with repeated exposure to the same or similar reinforcing stimulus, that initial response to pleasure gets weaker and shorter, but that after response to pain gets stronger and longer. In other words, our brains remember, they learn of what we've done before, and they accommodate or what neuroscientists call neuroadapt to that stimulus such that we don't get as much dopamine the second or third or 25th or 100th time around. And eventually uh, what happens is that we get no release at all potentially, but we get a huge come down. And eventually we end up mm. in this kind of chronic uh, state where our balance is tilted chronically to the side of pain. And I imagine that as these neuroadaptation gremlins who are slowly accumulating on the pain side of the balance and eventually are sort of living there, camped out you know, with their tents and barbecues in mm -hmm. tow. But from a neurobiological standpoint, what happens is we get into a dopamine deficit state, which is to say to accommodate the fire hose of dopamine that we're exposing our brain to by repeated exposure uh, to these highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors our brains have to downregulate dopamine transmission by involuting dopamine receptors, decreasing dopamine production, and we eventually end up in this chronic dopamine deficit state. And that is the addicted brain. Because once that has happened, now we need to use our drug not to get high, but just to re-equilibrate the balance, just to restore a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. And when we're not using we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, insomnia, irritability, depression, and craving. Furthermore, and this is very, very important, when we engage in other consumption of other more modest rewards that used to give us pleasure, those things no longer give us pleasure, right? Because we're walking around with our gremlins camped out on the pain side of the balance. We're in this dopamine deficit state. Now we need enormous quantities of pleasure to feel any pleasure at all. And equally important, we're very vulnerable to the merest kind of pain stimulus. Even the merest pain is very painful to us. And I believe that both on an individual and a global scale, we're all in this dopamine deficit state, right? Because our lives are so comfortable and because we have this infinite access to these highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, and the cumulative effect of that in an iterative fashion through time means that we're resetting our joy pathways to the side of pain. It's remarkable and, and quite distressing. Yeah, <laughs> but important because the implications for how to intervene to help people who are experiencing depression, anxiety, suicidality, or just everyday unhappiness uh, is going to be very different if in turn, you know, if it turns right. out that that's really true. Right. Yeah. Before we go into some of that, you mentioned that, I guess, in laboratory settings, uh, you all have been able to measure the sort of dopamine release so that you have a continuum in the book of lesser to greater release of dopamine, chocolate, sex, nicotine, cocaine, amphetamine, which is fascinating to realize that you can kind of quantify how great it is. But I, but I suppose experientially, you know, we, we kind of know that that's probably, we probably experientially know that that's, that's, that's right. But any commentary on that continuum? Yeah. So this is the work of many scientists over many years, primarily in uh, rats and mice, putting a probe right into their brain to measure dopamine firing in this specific circuit called the reward pathway that consists of the nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area, and the prefrontal cortex. And finding that when rats or rodents are exposed to different um, reinforcing substances and behaviors, uh, they have different increase in dopamine firing in that specific circuit. Important to recognize that we're all firing dopamine at a kind of tonic baseline level all the time. Mm -hmm. But what part of what tells us to either approach or avoid uh, a stimulus in our environment 
is whether or not it increases dopamine firing or not. And of course, anything that increases dopamine firing is something that uh, our brains then get the the message, you should get more of that, right? You, you, that's good, get more of that. And that's what's so hard about addiction is that what happens is that our brain then confuses something that we need for basic survival with something that we really should avoid, but that our brain is mistaken for something that we need for basic survival. I, I was fascinated. I don't think you discussed this in, in your book, but I remember reading uh, the case of, I, th- I think the scientists were named Milner and Olds, who perhaps were early folks in helping us explore dopamine. And as, I, as I recollect, they had one, one of them wasn't, wasn't very good in his laboratory skills and ex- accidentally put the probe in the wrong place and ended up discovering this dopamine thing. And that they could actually almost control these rats by controlling dopamine release in some grotesque experiments, even as, as I recollect, they, they could get them to run across electrified grates, burning their feet off because they knew if they got to the other end, they would get a hit of dopamine on the other end of the, of the maze. But it's remarkable stuff. You, you also talk about a, a case, I think, where they've discovered that if you take a rat uh, that hasn't been flooded with dopamine, they will help another rat try to escape. But if they're addicted, then they leave the rat to die. Is that could you describe that particular case for us? Yeah, so that was a case that came out a couple, an experiment that came out a couple of years ago, where if you put a rat in a cage with another rat who's trapped in a plastic bottle, the free rat will work very hard to release the trapped rat. So there's a sort of instinctual, you know, there's a, 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 a natural helping instinct that kicks in. But if you then expose that rat to to an opioid and then give that rat you know, the option of pressing a lever for more opioid versus helping to free the trapped rat, the rat will press the lever for more opioid. And I think that's a very powerful paradigm because it really gets to the heart of one of the major problems of addiction, which is the antisocial nature of the problem of addiction and how as we get into our addiction, we replace our connections with other living organisms with our drug. We mistake our drug for human connection or rat connection or wh- whatever it is. That human connection that's so fundamental to a life well lived and also to basic survival, that whole instinct gets hijacked uh, by the will to use drugs. And we see that again and again in humans, of course, that, of course, isolation in and of itself is an enormous stressor, which can lead to drug use as a way to try to fill the emptiness for the lack of human connection. But never forget, even in the context of very good, uh, healthy human connections, when people become addicted, they can turn away from those healthy connections and replace those connections with their addictive drug use and become antisocial because that's what drugs do. Before we turn to some of your suggested practices towards some solutions, do I understand correctly that the goal here is not to rid ourselves of dopamine? And and in fact, I understand that there are experiments in which if you take all levels of dopamine away from rats or mice, that they will not even eat food that might be right in front of them. That there's something about dopamine that's required for us in goal seeking. And so the goal is not to be rid of it but is to find the proper balance of it. So could you commentary on that? Sure. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, people talk about being addicted to dopamine, but we're not really addicted to dopamine. Dopamine is not a bad thing. Dopamine is a fundamental chemical signal in our brain that tells us when to pay attention to a stimulus in our environment and to approach that stimulus and check it out. And also the dopamine is associated with the experience of pleasure. Uh, when we do ingest or or use that behavior. There's a very famous experiment suggesting that dopamine is potentially even more important for motivation than it is for pleasure. Scientists engineered a rat to have no dopamine receptors in the reward circuit in the brain. And when they did that, they discovered if they put food into the rat's mouth, the rat would chew the food, eat the food, and seem to get pleasure from the food. But when they put the food even a body length away, the rat would starve to death because the absence Mm. of dopamine essentially deprived the rat from the motivation to do the work to go get 
the the natural life sustaining reward. Mm. So you know, dopamine. It's not that you know, dopamine is is good or bad. In fact, I would lean towards saying dopamine is good because we need it in order to tell us. Um, you know, what are the signals in the environment that we should pay attention to? The problem is when we have created substances and behaviors which mimic the kinds of natural rewards that uh, we need and want for survival and provide those in an immediately available, highly potent form that we can ingest quickly in an unlimited quantity, which then overwhelm the capacity of our ancient primitive wiring to be able to accommodate or know what to do with or respond to in a healthy way. And that's mm -hmm. when we get, you know, this dopamine overload followed by this dopamine deficit state, which then becomes, you know, our new readjusted baseline. You're listening to Tokens Public Theology, Human Flourishing and the Good Life. We are most grateful to have you joining us. If you've not yet done so, subscribe today to the Tokens Podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We do love hearing from you and are always pleased to hear some of the things you'd like to hear more about. You can email us at podcast at tokensshow.com. Thanks to my friend Dan Miller, who wrote in, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying your recordings from the Sound Emporium. The latest on the social consciousness of bluegrass is just stellar. End quote. Of course, I was pleased that Dan said he especially enjoyed my own rendition of John Henry. So we thought we'd give you a taste of that here again today. Great to hear from you, Dan. Hope you are doing well down in Florida. Also, remember you can sign up for our email list or find out how to join us for a live event all at tokenshow.com. Well, the man who invented that old steam drill, he thought it was mighty fine. John Henry drove it down 15 feet while steam drill only made it nine. Law, law, steam drill only made it nine. This is our interview with Dr. Anna Lemke, professor at Stanford University and author of the New York Times bestseller, Dopamine Nation. Special thanks also to my friend Andrew Nelson, who said, hey, Uncle Lee, I think you'll like this book. How sweet it is to have nephews who know books you might like. Coming up, we'll hear about the practices and possibilities for a person seeking to break addictive tendencies. Part two in just a moment. Welcome back to Tokens and our interview with Dr. Anna Lemke. So I've been beginning to talk about some of the practices you suggest in helping us reset this balance, you discuss self-binding as a, as a crucial potential practice. So define that for us. Well, if we accept that we're living in a drugified world in which almost every substance that we ingest and every behavior that we engage in, even what we would consider to be healthy and adaptive behaviors, has become you know, drugified in some way, made addictive through technology and access, quantity, novelty, um, then really um, we're looking at a very difficult problem to solve because we've got this primitive wiring that's mismatched for the modern ecosystem that we've created. And so the way to survive in this world is to really build a world within a world uh, where we intentionally limit our access to these drugs. And we do that through self-binding. And self-binding is where we essentially create both literal and metacognitive barriers between ourselves and the many drugs that exist out there that we could consume. And self-binding can take different forms. These can be literal barriers where we, for example, don't have potato chips in the house. When we travel, we ask the hotel to remove the mini bar before we get there. We have a system of making sure that we don't bring our smartphone or other digital devices into the bedroom. So these are all kind of literal a geographical barriers. But we can also use different kinds of metacognitive barriers where we may say, I'm not going to use on these days of the week, or when I do use, I'm only going to use for a couple hours, or I'm not going to use until I cross this finish line, either the finish line being I'm going to abstain for a certain amount of time so that I can reset my reward pathways and then I'll use, or I'm not going to use until I, you know, 
take my qualifying exam or finish this big project or get to this holiday on the calendar. We can also use categorical barriers, and that's where we say, um, I'm not going to use, except in this particular context, like I'm not going to use alone, I'm only going to use with friends, or I'm only going to use at a celebratory event, or I'm only going to use in the context of some kind of spiritual rite of passage. So these are all the kinds of ways in which we can create barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice, acknowledging that we have to temper our use in a world of overwhelming overabundance. And that if we wait until we're in the throes of desire, we will essentially not be able to override the powerful physiology of neuroadaptation that drives us to want to consume our drug. So the notion then of limiting ourselves or placing some sort of fast or self-imposed limits then becomes a route to a new sort of freedom. Is that one way to say what I hear you describing? Yeah, I think that's a really nice way to put it because we have to have a kind of awe for the power of our brain's physiology to drive compulsive overconsumption in the context of overwhelming abundance. We are wired to consume as much as we can in the shortest amount of time because our brains evolved for a world of scarcity and ever-present danger. And that was the only way that we could make it. If you came upon a berry bush, you would try to eat every single berry on, on that berry before someone else did or before a lion ate you or just to stock up because who knew what, where there might be the next berry bush. But now, of course, we're surrounded 24-7 by these great big, giant, juicy berries that uh, you know have been pumped full of sugar and salt and fat and, and you name it. So, so it's a real problem that, that you know, our basic wiring, again, is at odds with the modern ecosystem. So we have to anticipate that we are going to struggle and that, that overcoming our own basic physiology is basically impossible, even for the average person, and, and then anticipate desire and create roadblocks in advance so that we can live in accordance with our own nature and consume in a way that we know is healthy and good for us and makes us healthy and happy in the long run. So it's really acknowledging the mismatch, anticipating desire, understanding the power of the physiologic drive, and then putting those barriers up in advance so that we can press the pause button between desire and consumption, which means that, you know, we can certainly overcome those self-binding strategies, but just that little extra bit of time may be enough to remind ourselves what our goals are. The other thing too, is that once we've gotten into a addicted brain, once we've reset, you know, our hedonic pathways to the new baseline of that dopamine deficit state, then we really need to abstain for long enough for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off the pain side of the balance mm. so that homeostasis or a level balance can be restored. And this is really important because restoring a level balance allows us, number one, to take joy again in more modest rewards or in our mm. drug of choice in more modest amounts, but also really importantly, allows us to get our prefrontal cortex back online so that we can see true cause and effect. Because when we're chasing dopamine, we really are unable to see the true impact of our drug use or our overconsumption of whatever the drug or behavior is on our lives. We get into this very complicated pathological space where we can absolutely minimize and rationalize our consumption. <laughs> And as long as we're in that vortex of compulsive overuse, kind of at war with those gremlins, we really can't see the objective reality. So we have to have a dopamine fast, reset reward pathways before we can actually look back and say, oh my goodness, like who, who was that person who was putting all that time, energy, money, creativity into, you know, hunting down that drug and using it in that compulsive way. And I've seen that so many times with patients where they kind of have this aha moment. They're like, that's, I don't even recognize myself. It's a fascinating scientific description of commentary, whether from a recovery perspective or a philosophical, moral philosoph philosophical perspective, or even a theological perspective on issues like powerlessness and willpower. 
And so what I hear you saying is that the notion of powerlessness is very real, that there's a moment in our seeking which one simply cannot employ the prefrontal cortex to say, no, I'm not going to do that, that we do what we don't want to do. But one can still employ their willpower, but the willpower comes in at the level of, in this case, doing the act of self-binding, of giving some sort of distance between the stimulus and our reaction to the stimulus, which is it's just, it's just very, very fascinating. Yeah, no, that, I, I love that. That was beautifully said. You know, one of the common themes in addiction medicine is that the relapse doesn't happen the moment that the person ingests their drug after a period of abstinence. The relapse happens in the days and weeks before as the, mm. the person begins to disregard well, what, what I call self-binding, the, the important barriers and practices that they know they need to engage in on a regular basis in order to stay in recovery or in order to maintain their abstinence. And that's really, really true because we essentially, you know, addiction is the loss of autonomy or agency. The gremlins take over and we are their slaves. And that's true. I think, you know, any of us can, can relate to that phenomenon. But where I will say the, uh, there's still a little bit of will that's preserved, even in that moment of out of control addictive behavior. It's not the will to not consume because that we lose, but at least in, in severe addiction. But we still in that moment have a will to ask for help. And that is very fascinating and something that, you know, you mm. probably can't create an animal model for, but which is mm. distinctly human, that moment where we can give it over to someone else or a power greater than ourselves and ask for help. And that is a fascinating thing, the way in which acknowledging our own loss of, of, of will and, you know, surrendering it or giving it over to a power greater than ourselves mm allows us, you know, in this very fascinating and mysterious way to actually regain some degree of agency. Fascinating. You know, one, of, one other quick theological note uh, before we move on is that I've heard lots of folks, and understandably so, I think, in the recovery world, want to avoid the language of sin with regard to addiction. But at least from the perspective of somebody like the Apostle Paul in the New Testament— Sin is, is much more like what you were describing. That is, it's a space of slavery where we simply cannot choose to do what we know we want to do or what is good for us, and we choose what we don't want to choose. That's sin, not this sort of moralistic getting up one day and saying, I'm going to do something bad today, but this sort of bondage in which we find ourselves and we need some sort of help or some sort of power beyond ourselves to move beyond, which, I find, again, I find the overlap between those sets of descriptions fascinating. Yeah, no, I I, I agree. I agree. I mean, let's just stay there because I, I love this. You know, yeah. I mean, I have really, I think of sin, you know, and this is through my own work and also through my own life. To me, what, what people misunderstand about sin is that it's really not about a bad person or a person doing a bad thing. What it's really about is how we're all vulnerable to do bad things, which is a different thing, mm. right? It's, right? It's a different right. thing than saying this person's bad or this person's sin. What it's saying is that sin is in the world. We are, human beings are vulnerable to sin, all of us, all of us. And so we, we have to help each other and help ourselves to guard against the sin that we are all capable of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's even we. I'm I'm continuing to wander into theological stuff here, but there's also in a lot of theological study in the last half century, a lot of fascinating research that's been done on so-called principalities and powers, which at its best is not this sort of notion of demons floating around and getting you know getting on the back of somebody's brain, but it's a description of social realities right. that are intended for humankind's good, but rather than actually serving humankind's good, they take on a power that leads us towards destruction. And so your descriptions in the first part of our conversation about the problem and the way this gets wrought out in economics, the way it gets wrought out in technology, the way it's in our cell phones, that's a, that's a perfect social description of what the theologians are trying to describe when they talk about things like principalities and powers. Yeah, 
Right, right. And and I agree with that. You know, the uh, I think we we really we think of ourselves as like choosing, but so much of what we do in life is a product of the world we live in and the people that we're surrounded with. We're we're, we're so vulnerable, right? We 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 have so much less agency than we actually believe that we have. And so much of what we perceive as our choosing really is the downstream effect of so many different choices yeah. that preceded it and not just our choices the choices right. of the millions of millions of people you know in the human race all over the world and so right. when i think when we see it from that much larger level it's a more accurate representation really yes yeah thank you another sort of perhaps counterintuitive practice you prescribe is the pursuit of pain. Right. So talk to us about that. Well, it really leads right from the neuroscience, which is to say we know that when we press on the pleasure side of the balance, we get an equal and opposite effect on the side of pain. And eventually, repeated pleasures leads to this chronic dopamine deficit state or the gremlins camped out on the pain side of the balance. But it turns out if the initial stimulus is a moderate press on the pain side of the balance, then the gremlins will hop on the pleasure side in order to bring it level again. And that has very interesting implications because it means that maybe with painful stimuli, whether psychological or cognitive or actual physical pain, we can actually get our dopamine indirectly by paying for it up front. And there's a wealth of science in an area called uh, the science of hormesis, which is Greek for to set in motion, which shows that by exposing an organism to mild to moderate toxic or noxious stimuli, uh, you actually make the organism more resilient and healthier. Hmm. And the way that happens is that the body senses injury and in response upregulates the body's own re-regulating healing mechanisms. So for example, when we exercise, we know that exercise is immediately toxic to cells. And when the body senses that, what it starts to do is increase our feel-good hormones and neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, you know, you name it, endogenous opioids. And that those elevated levels of dopamine, which begin in the latter half of the exercise, not right away, because they're a response to the injury, then remain, those dopamine levels remain elevated for hours afterwards before going back down to baseline levels. So that has very compelling implications for ways that we can get pleasure and get dopamine, which we want because, you know, we, we need that in our lives, but we can do it indirectly by inviting or exposing ourselves to painful stimuli. Now, a key part of this science is that it can't be too much pain and it can't be all at once because then the organism dies, right? Which is why doing something like cutting on ourselves is not healthy because that's too much pain. It's too potent to form. We get a huge release of endogenous opioids in response to self-cutting. And then we essentially deplete our opioid system so that then we're mm. anhedonic or unable to release opioids afterwards. The same mm. thing, interestingly, with jumping out of airplanes, which produces this profound high that can last for days but then leads, and there's a small literature on this, often leads to a kind of anhedonia and a need to then repeatedly jump out of airplanes to experience any joy at all. So we're looking at mild to moderate noxious stimuli. That's fascinating. Prayer, meditation, exercise, martial arts, other kinds of mind-body work, sustained concentration, sustained creative endeavors, these types of things that are effortful at a modest degree, iterative over many days that upregulate our own endogenous mm. uh, dopamine production. I was pretty excited to see that you talk about the gift of the cold shower. Yes. I've been a practitioner of cold showers for years, and uh, I'm a big fan That's of That's amazing. My hat goes off to you. I can't do that. Like, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I do, I've exercised, but I literally, cold water, I can't do it. So I'm always impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. You can do no, it. No, I seriously I, cannot. I Trust me. I was in Iceland. <laughs> I tried it all. The cold. No, I did, it can't do it. Uh, another practice you point to is uh, radical honesty. But you began with pointing to how much we lie and uh, kind of deleterious effects of lying. So give us a little bit of commentary about that. Yeah. So the average adult tells one to two lies per day. 
Most often mm. we lie about little things to sort of protect our ego, things that cover up the minor ways in which we're selfish or look stupid or silly or made mistakes. One of the things that I've learned from patients in recovery from severe addiction is that they can't lie about anything. They can't even lie about little things unrelated to their addiction because once they do, they're very liable to a relapse. So that, that's mm. very, that became very interesting to me. And I started to study what could it be about this sort of embracing truth in every instance that is so fundamental to, to sustain recovery. And ultimately, I've come to believe to, to really the good life for all of us, whether or not we're addicted. I think it works on a lot of different levels. First of all, I'm telling the truth, especially when it comes to being honest about the ways in which we're protecting our own ego is really important for fostering intimacy. And we always talk about intimacy as an antidote to addiction, but we don't often talk about how to get intimacy. And it turns mm -hmm. out that re being really, really honest and not hiding the little things is a really important core piece of, of intimacy in our relationships. We always think that we're when we tell people the ways in which we've messed up, that they're going to go running away from us. But in fact, mm -hmm. the opposite happens and they're drawn toward us right. because they recognize in our, in our own mistakes, their own humanity, and that makes them feel better about themselves. And so it really does foster intimacy when we're authentically honest and reluctant to do so, but we do it anyway. Yeah. I've heard uh, therapists, therapists use the cheesy line about intimacy might be defined as into me see. Oh, very um, good. But there's something true I about love that, that, right? Yeah. That, I love that. Yeah. yeah. If I've heard that before, I forgot. That's great. Mm -hmm. You also suggest that truth telling engenders an abundance or a plenty mindset and lying a scarcity mindset. I found this fascinating. I've never heard that before. Yeah. So again, this was all just part of my exploration about why truth telling helps people in recovery from addiction and how it might help all of us, whether or not you know, we're struggling with, with addiction per se. And, you know, one of the fascinating things about our culture today to me is that despite our overwhelming abundance, we seem to be lying more than ever, which is really strange because, hmm. you know, you would think that as we're not living at the subsistence level, there's really no, no need to lie. And yet what I think happens, you know, and this is a little bit complicated, but Part of, you know, why people lie is, you know, as a way to use language as a tool to protect themselves from, from predators. And so in a scarcity landscape where you feel like, oh, you know, uh, I can't rely on other people, resources are mm -hmm. scarce, people are going to be, you know, they're, they're at the survival mode, they're going to be lying as a way to just kind of protect themselves. Mm. And part of that was uh, looking at the marshmallow experiment that, and this is a famous Stanford experiment where you ask kids, you give them a marshmallow and you say, okay, you know, if you don't eat this for 15 minutes, you can get a second marshmallow. And it's very age dependent. The older the child, the more likely they're be able, able to do this, to exercise essentially their willpower to wait for it. But then if you lie to that child and you say, hey, you know, if you ring this bell, I'll come back, but you don't come back when the child rings the bell that child is much more likely to eat that marshmallow and not be able hmm. to wait for the second marshmallow. So in other words, if a child feels like they can't count on the people around them to do what they said they were going to do because that person lied to them, that's much more likely to put that person into a survival or scarcity mindset in which they're going to be like, okay, I can't trust other people, so I better eat up this marshmallow and get anything else I can because hmm. you know, the environment is unpredictable. Hmm. Whereas if we have the sense that we can trust other people and that there's kind of um, a well of abundance, then we're able to delay gratification because we have this assurance of other people being there for us. And this hmm. comes into play in a paradoxical way today because although we're living in this world of incredible material abundance, we are living in a world of immaterial scarcity or a world in which we, we increasingly people lie. And so we feel we can't, we can't rely on them. And so that will then drive us to turn toward material consumption and overconsumption of these various drugs as a way to, I think, kind of fill that spiritual void. Um, not to mention that once we're chasing dopamine, 
even if we're surrounded by abundance, we feel like we're surrounded by scarcity because we're chasing that drug. Mm. So it works on a lot of yeah. complex levels. Yeah. In the th couple of minutes we have left, I want to turn to your very last chapter where you speak of the importance of turning toward our lived experience and the world. And I wonder, if I recollect correctly, your um, perhaps undergraduate studies were in the humanities. Yes. And I, I wonder if this is kind of where your humanities come back into your work, this sort of beautiful picture of engaging a full, abundant life, taking the beauty of the world and the beauty of life seriously. But tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I, certainly my, you know, humanities, education, you know, philosophical traditions have influenced these ideas, theological traditions. But what what I think where I'm coming from most strongly is just my clinical experience over the last 25 years, observing how all of us increasingly are turning away from the lives that we're be, we've been given and seeking to distract ourselves with the ever-increasing types of distractions that are available to us. And I think it's a natural natural that we want to do that. We, we want to experience this loss of self. We want to forget ourselves. We want to merge with something greater than ourselves. And what we're turning toward now to do that is the, these, this, you know, the many ever increasing numbers of escapist behaviors, especially online, that really can in the short term serve this purpose and function, but which don't get us to where we really want to go. Because, you know, at some point we have to come out of our intoxicated reverie and then we're left with a much more impoverished life. So instead what we need to do is really avoid these intoxicants and this pleasure seeking for its own sake and turn toward uh, the pain in our lives, turn toward the hard things, find that angle of repose in the lives that we've been given, tolerate the boredom, tolerate the distress and dis-ease and see how the shape of our lives changes when we do that and become something three-dimensional and beautiful and really awe-inspiring, as well as, you know, terrific with the entomology of terror built into it um, that we're not mm. going to find in escapist fantasy distractions. We've been talking to Dr. Anna Lemke author of the New York Times bestselling book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemke, for your work and for your generous time with us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation. You've been listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life. If you'd like to hear more about digital addiction and the practices we might use to combat it, check out our recent interview with John Mark Comer, author of the best-selling book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Remember, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And if you've got feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Email us text or attach a voice memo and send to the address podcast at tokenshow.com. Thanks to all the Stellar team that makes this podcast possible. Executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management. Co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios. Associate producers Ashley Bain and Tom Anderson. Music director Tim Lauer. Engineer Carrie Harmon. Music beds by Zach and Maggie White and Blue Dot Sessions. Thanks for listening and peace be unto thee. The Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studios. Oh. <laughs>